and where they're from is they prefer to eat smaller meals but regular and what i find is we've given them asfs um and again a bit more protein packed um yeah so right. like a bodybuilder yeah. oh, um, right. more protein packed uh more bang for your buck if you like um you know it really does make a difference but it's, it's, it's an interesting point you know and, and like i said we all th always think bigger is better get the snake to eat a bigger prey item it'll grow faster but if it's if it's it's like giving them an ice cream sundae you know the ice cream sundae is not going to build lean tissue on their body no. it's going to build just fat reserves <laughs>
what's the word they're unforgiving you know oh, they're really? life bearing species you you know as well as i do you you've had some yeah I, I, this is a shame dave but you know what what the, whether you're breeding boas or bull pythons it teaches you persistence it teaches you patience and it teaches you you, you know never give up you know yeah. there's always next year but bull pythons are a lot more forgiving um yeah. regarding the breeding side of things but yeah it's I got a um, a clutch of uh, I was breeding het pied to het pied bow, and no one's really you know that's a very new project in the bow world. And I got a basically a female who delivered twenty infertile ova. You know, yeah, I, I wanted to like blow my brains out you know, <laughs> because yeah. it's just so frustrating, you know. But that's the boa game, and you have to understand it. it you know, and it's it's interesting because you know. Um, obviously I come from the bodybuilding world and bodybuilding is all about patience too, you know, and a lot of guys don't have patience in that world, but if you don't, it's eat, train, sleep, repeat, eat, train, sleep, yeah. repeat. And if you can't do that every single day of your life, you're not going to be a good bodybuilder. So breeding snakes is the same thing. It's not that exciting, except you have exciting days. It's like bodybuilding. Yeah. If you go on stage, that's an exciting day for you. But yeah. the day your, your snake may lay eggs and maybe the day they hatch, that's exciting. The rest of the year is cleaning poops, feeding rats, and you know and that's it yeah. and, and repeating it right every single day yeah yeah 100 percent. and that's it, it's it's exactly the same you, you know you, you've got to have you know persistence is key whether you're training you're breeding snakes you know you've got to do all the leg work before you achieve what you want to achieve and, yeah. and whether that be like again you know regarding bodybuilding sleeping eating is so important training is is just that much and it's the same with the eggs. You know, we want to achieve that much, but we've we've got to feed them, we've got to grow them, we've got to keep them mm -hmm. healthy, we've got to yep. look after them. It's everything in between. And sometimes, like last night, I did a live on YouTube, and I was going to feed and do the live and answer some questions. Sure. And it actually ended up being me just constantly asking questions. And by the time I finished, it was late, you know, and I've still got to do, I've still got to feed like over a hundred snakes. <laughs> um, but you know it is relentless but there's a lot of passion behind it as well so that really helps i'm like an old grandmother when i'm feeding my snakes if, if the snake eats i'm so happy inside i'm so thrilled that like oh hey i feel yeah. so good i can sleep well at night and then if i had that one snake that i love and it doesn't eat no. I, i'm like worried all night you know i'm like yeah. i want to i want to call them up and say D did you eat it yet did you eat it yet you know, yeah. That kind of thing. yeah and it's crazy because you're walking to your partner or to your mate who's not into snakes and you go oh i'm really happy he's she's eaten or he's eaten and he's been on a fast and they're like what are you telling us for we're not bothered we're not interested right. you know right. yeah it's I like, it's, care. it's like the when you if you treat a snake for a respiratory and that first meal it eats after it gets over the respiratory you're like oh thank god the snake made yeah. it you know yeah so. there's so many things especially again after a female lays eggs you know again Every giving them that first meal you want them to take that first mm -hmm. meal uh hatchlings you know that one amazing yeah. combo that you've produced you want it to eat you know because you get it feeding it's going to go for you um yeah uh, yeah Let no one understands about that let me ask you a question about feeding hatchlings. Um, ball pythons tend to eat pretty well, you know, once the, they, they come out of the egg. How long do you, number one, wait to feed for the first time after a snake hatches? Um, so I've got a little bit of a routine, Dave. So what I tend to do, first of all, I use uh, an LP5 tub or the equivalent, which is a, an FB5 tub, okay? Okay, pretty much. Um, and what I'll do um, seven days, five to seven days after its first shed, mm -hmm. I then offer it a ASF. I feed exclusively ASFs. Oh, do you breed and them? Will, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I will offer like a, a hopper, mm -hmm. okay? And what I find is the hopper, its movements yep. tends to create that like that, that buzz on the snake, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I so agree. I will offer it a live for its first to three meals. And then after that, I'll switch it on to frozen thawed. And again, I feed every five days. So I'll feed on the 5th, the 10th, the 15th, the 20th, the 25th, and the 30th of every month. That right. way, I haven't got to fill in the feeding card, but I know when I'm feeding. And once I've had five consecutive feeds, I know they're good to go. How long will you consider that? Will you um, 
follow up that five day feeding schedule? Do you stop it at some point and go to less frequently? Yeah. So I tend to go to less frequency, probably when they reach 300 grams, 250, okay. 300 grams, then I'll obviously go to the standard seven day routine, which is what all my holdbacks do. Right. Um, as for worrying about when they're going to not feed. Um, so if, for example, I've got six snakes from the same clutch and there's one that's not feeding, right. I'll probably wait until its siblings have had their third or fourth meal right. before I'll start to assist feed. But right. what I've found, Dave, is by doing it this way, uh, the last season just gone, I've only had out of, I think it was something like 300 and... 320 snakes. I've had two, which I had to assist feed, and they're yeah. doing perfectly fine. That's so, usually what it is. Now, when you assist feed, um, will you are you one of these people that will only do it for a certain period of time and then stop, or will you do it as long as the snake continues to live? Yeah, I'll do it as long as it takes. But what I tend to find, Dave, is once you get their, their metabolism going, their gut going, if you like, yeah. Um, that they tend to switch straight on, you know. Um, I've had some of my cis feeders from way back in the day. Uh, they they become some of my best breeders, you know, and best feeders. So funny like that, right? You know, what's the longest you you've had to assist feed a snake? Um, probably know. about six weeks. Probably about <laughs> six weeks. You know, yeah. I'll tell you what I do. What I do is um, I leave them in the incubator, you know, after, even after they shed sometimes for a week or yeah. two. And then, then I set them up obviously. And mm -hmm. sometimes they don't really, they're not really having their first meal for like almost three weeks, sometimes two weeks yeah. after, after they've hatched. And I find that they're starving by then. And they, yeah. and usually they, they eat really well. It, yeah. it works really well with carpet pythons because carpet pythons can be pain in the necks too, you know? Um, See, that's, that's the good thing, Dave, is that there's so many ways to do it. Right. And there's, there's multiple methods to achieve mm -hmm. what we want to achieve. Right. Um, again, similar to training, you know, there's multiple methods, but carpet pythons, I've heard they can be a bit of a pain in the uh, in the backside yeah. to get going, you know? I, I, I assist that a carpet python for three years. Wow. Three years. Wow. Three years. And I, you know, the only reason I did it was because it was the first, it was the first carpet baby I'd ever produced. And it, I kind of, I kind of like got like attached to it. And yeah. I never, I never thought it was going to eat. And this one yeah. day. It ate. It just and, went. And, and next thing I know, it was eating small rats. And, and now it's, you know, it might even breed for me next year. So, but she, three years, she was eating, she was like so undersized that the, she was smaller than the clutch that hatched the year after that. Yeah. And, um, but I didn't give up on her. I had two ball pythons too, just recently. They were double head um, hypo clowns. And nice. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't want to, and they were females. And I didn't, you know, I couldn't sell them, obviously, because they were not yeah. eating. And I, and I didn't want to like just let them starve to death. So I said, ah, we'll yep. keep feeding them." And they were like over a year, and they, and then and now they're great eaters. It's it's the weirdest yeah. thing, you know. It, you know what, Dave? I think again, there's not many people um, who will persevere with certain things like we do in the hobby uh, <laughs> and in our industry. Yeah, because we know the importance of perseverance. Yes. And and the one thing you know, growing up as children. We're very impatient, you know. It's like Christmas morning. You know those eggs in the incubator, you know. It's Christmas morning every time they're hatching or, or you know they're going to hatch. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, again, we still have to go through that routine. And, we, again, we know how important, you know, feeding those animals are. And you've just got to keep persevering with it. You know, it's, it's funny you say that because when I first started breeding, like, the first year, I knew maybe I produced some eggs. Well, I was checking the eggs, like, a thousand times a day. And I, and I was, you know – because at the time this was like in the early, like maybe 2015, you know, people were yeah. like cutting eggs and, yeah. and and every time I started cutting eggs, you know, early, like a week early, it, I was always screwing them up. And, and, and you know what? I said, I'm not touching these eggs anymore. When the first one pips, I'll Thank slit you. the other ones. And that, yeah. that's what I do now. Is, is that something similar to what you do? Yeah. So, I mean, and here's, here's the thing, Dave, is for as much as, we 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 learn as we go on obviously and um for me cutting eggs was always about obviously you want to see what's inside but i also wanted to make sure that the babies yeah. had a fair opportunity to get out at the end of the day we've gone through that effort to breed the parents and the parents have gone through all that effort 
So we want to give them as much chance as possible. And for me, I I basically, again, I know my incubator temperatures. I know my incubation method. Right. And that's important because, you know, we can say to people, incubate at this temperature and then cut on day 55. But their substrate may be different. It may not be wet sure. enough. It may be too wet, right. et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to really learn your process. Um, but what I like to do, mine normally starts to pip around about day 53, 54. I run slightly warmer temperatures. Okay. Um, but How, again, what, what temps in the incubator? Um, I'm running I'm running 91. Oh, really? See, I, yeah. I run, I do the opposite. I run 86. So mine take like wow. almost like 65 to 70 days to hatch. Yeah. See, I do that, Dave, because I'm collecting some data at the moment, which this will be my fifth year, my uh, sixth season collecting mm. this data. Okay. And what I'm finding is if I uh, incubate at slightly hotter temperatures, again, right. with my method, I'm getting about 75% more females than males. Really? Wow. We, yeah. I didn't know that the, the ball pythons, I don't think anyone ever talked about that being sex dependent. You know? he, he, here's the thing, Dave, because we, again, we're only really what? We've been breeding ball pythons since what? Really the 90s? Right. Let's say, you know, it's not very long for, for, for research and development, if you like, regarding mm -hmm. what's what. We have a baseline you know, right. incubator, 89 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever. Um, but what I've learned over the last five years, and again, the data I've collected uh, regarding the animals and the sex, you know, I'm finding that I'm hatching 75% more females. Now, I wouldn't advise anyone just to go out there and do 91 degrees <laughs> Fahrenheit. Right. This is something, again, I'm comfortable at doing. I know what I'm doing. If anyone's starting out, I recommend 89 to 88 you know is a right. good starting process um but yeah i'm finding that's that's where i want to be i'm finding they're they're thriving they're doing really well um and yeah so i incubate at 91. do you um do you have to keep, worry about humidity a little bit more in there because i would think at a hotter temperature there would be more uh, yeah so, so the way i do my egg box dave um, which again is all on my channel. I try and redo the video every year just to refresh people's yeah, memory. I, I, yeah, tell um, people. yeah, hundred percent. So again, the, the the way I do it is almost like suspending the eggs on uh, the substrate. So instead of putting them into the substrate, I use like a dragon hatch tray, uh, right. and I'll put it on them, and it will suspend it. So it doesn't matter. I can have that swimming in water. As long as it's not touching the eggs, yeah. So I don't tend to worry about humidity. Yeah, I, I just I, I do something similar. I, I put them in. I put them on wet sponges, and I put like yeah. a, either the dragon uh, product that you talked about, or I use like just great. You know, the light grading yeah. work seems yeah. to work really, really well. Yeah. It, you know, it, it and you know, I just every time I use like rep. Uh, excuse me. Um, um, what is it called? Um, vermiculite. Oh, I always. It either was always too wet or or too, too dry. or too dry, and and I yes. and I lost eggs initially, and I said, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't want to have to depend on worry about that. Here's a here's a little video of you actually doing your um, your thing there. And what are those trays called again, and where can people so get them? They're, they're dragon hatch trays, so right. uh, they're made in the UK. They're designed. What I'll do, Dave, I've got some green ones, so I'll okay. have to send you some green ones over, and you can have ah, some. Ah, nice. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the balls to you limited edition one. So send me your address later. I'll see some over. But yeah, they're, they're absolutely amazing. Uh, great, fantastic trays. Um, and they're, they're designed um, so that you, you know yourself, sometimes ball python eggs aren't perfectly sized. So they work really right. well. So yeah. Yeah, I've gotten some yeah. giant ones. I've gotten some really small ones too. But yeah, yeah. I'll send you. I'll I send actually you have my turtle eggs. eggs. I had so my turtles laid some eggs. I put them on these on, I, on one of those, and uh, I don't know if they're ever. Good. I, I have yet to get a turtle egg hatch at all ever. So <laughs> that's that's, uh, that's up for debate. Now it let is, me. Um, yeah. No good. No, I was just going to say there's a lot of species out there which are very difficult to to breed and uh, you know to get eggs. So the fact that you're getting eggs is is a good thing. Yeah, I, I get eggs twice a year. Uh, they, do, they double clutch on me, but I don't. I don't know if they're either not fertile or they're. You know, this this last clutch I had was the has been the best clutch so far in terms of they're not. 
they're not looking like rotten or getting all yeah. kinds of like mold on them. Yeah. So that's that's probably a good sign. A lot of people don't realize turtle eggs take long. Everyone thinks that every everyone thinks that you know the Python sixty day you know inc uh, incubation in the, in the uh, inc uh, incubator is like what everything does, but everyone has different. I mean, some monitors go what like nine months or something like that, right? Oh yeah. I mean, don't forget ball pythons after they pre lay shed or after they've actually ovulated are incubating their eggs internally. That's so true. they're still incubating. So even when they, they come out and we think, oh, we've got 55 days, <laughs> they've actually been incubating them for something like, you know, between right. 30 and 60 days before they actually lay them. So, you know, they've just done some of the work for us. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Mama mama, mama helps out sometimes. What's, yeah. the, um, what's the youngest you've ever gotten a female to breed at? Um, you know what, Dave? I would say 18 months. Um, yeah. If you remember back in the day, there used to be that thousand gram one year wall that the females used to hit. Yes, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> Some of them still do. And, <laughs> yeah, and and everyone sort of like again, we always used to think why. And I remember Ralph Davies talking a lot about it on his forums and stuff. Um, and what I realised was actually in the wild, a male and a female would become sexually mature at the same time. So right. if you think about it, you're not going to have a male get mature before the female. So they're going to be sexually mature at the same time. So actually that thousand gram wall now, year of age, I mean, again, you you have to be experienced. I'm not, ex I'm, I'm not, I don't expect everyone to go out and do this, but what I find is they're not, they're not interested in food. They're interested in breeding. Yes. So what I tend to do is I put a male in, not expecting to get a clutch, I do it to get them switching back on food because now I do what's called instinctive breeding. So I, I sort of watch what the animals are doing and then I give them what they want, if that makes sense. And yep. uh, what I found is by the time that if that female goes on to drop a clutch of eggs, it's normally, you know, six to eight months down the line. And right. she's normally six to 800 grams heavier. So, you know what I mean? That's that's how I do things. If they're not ready, they won't breed, they won't go. So I tend to do what they want to do more than anything. You're 100% right. And do you notice also that when you seem to hatch the eggs and grow the females yourself, they tend to sometimes have a much better chance of, of going earlier because they eat better? Yeah. And again, if you look at the species in Africa, on in the HQ, I have a map up of, of Africa and you can see where they're from. They mm -hmm. predominantly eat smaller prey items so mouse species asfs are a mouse species predominantly mm. and where they're from is they prefer to eat smaller meals but regular and what i find is we've given them asfs um and again a bit more protein packed um yeah so right. like a bodybuilder yeah. oh, um, right. more protein packed uh more bang for your buck if you like um you know it really does make a difference 100%. Do, you, do you find your snakes grow as well on the ASFs as they do on, on medium rats? Because obviously they're a little smaller, you know. Yeah, if anything, Dave, I find they have a better coloration. I find they poo less because they're absorbing more from the right. ASF. Right. Um, you, you know, as again, it, uh, we're using the, the, the bodybuilding, the health side of things with our animals because yeah. you know as well as I do, when we have food that doesn't agree with us, it goes in one end and out the other. You know what I'm saying? Right. You're 100% right. It's very right. similar. Um, for me, you see the poos are less. It doesn't smell as bad. They mm. tend to take more from the rodent. They tend to look like coloration. They tend to look better. The, their muscle tone, Dave, is that they're a lot more, I find they're more solid. And there's more and more people who are finding this for themselves, that their animals are more leaner, so, it's like yeah. eating chicken and fish versus a, a fatty steak every day. Yeah, so exactly. you're going to be leaner and and more muscular. You're going to be less fat. I mean, that's yeah. basically yeah. Yeah. Um, so we see that. Is, the question is though: Do pipe ball pythons benefit from having a little bit of body fat when they go through that breeding season as like an energy source, you know, type of thing? To a certain well, I I find Dave that when the female has had enough, she'll stop. You, right. you, 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 I've kept boas, you breed boas. You know as well as I do, you can overfeed a boa. So <laughs> you can get, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, and what people are learning with boas and retics and berms is actually if we feed them a little bit less, yes. they probably go on to be healthier and give better clutches. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
again, same principle. If we go out there and eat plenty of beef burgers, not saying they're bad for us, too many of them ain't going to be very good for our health. Yeah, and it's no. the same for them in my eyes. It's an interesting point, you know, and like I said, we all always think bigger is better. Get the snake to eat a bigger prey item. It'll grow faster. But if it's, if it's, it's like giving them an ice cream sundae, you know, the ice cream sundae is not going to build lean tissue on their body. No. It's going to build just fat reserves. And yeah. uh, like you said, the good thing about ball pythons is they really do limit themselves to how much they, yeah. they want food wise. Whereas a lot of these other snakes just will eat until they're obese. And that usually destroys their breeding potential, you know, so. hundred percent. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something now, Dave. So feeding ASFs in the breeding season, you'd think that, the, the ball pythons turn into like crackheads, you know, the yeah. females, they go crazy for it. Yeah. But if you offer them a, um, like a 150 gram X breeder ASF, right? Well, take it, but then they'll drop it and leave it. Most, really? yeah, yeah. Most females will only eat or prefer to eat between 50 and 70 gram ASFs during breeding season. Wow. If you give them anything too big, it's almost like they're going. An instinct, they're taking it, if you like, and killing it because we free frozen thawed. Right. Um, but they will drop it and just not want to eat it because it's almost like, you know what? I'm not feeling that. It's too big. Right. I'll leave it. But if you've got something smaller, I'll take it. So they're pretty smart then, ball pythons, is what you're saying. you know. And that's I, think, yeah. I think they know more what's going on. And again, that's, again, the females can pick and choose the sperm. That's why they can retain it and drop mm. it and they can utilize it. Um, th there's a lot. There's a lot to this species that we don't give them credit for. I'll tell you one thing. I try to breed a, um, a pair, a monarch to a, a super pastel uh, sugar het monarch yeah. for three years in a row. And these snakes, when I would put them together, you would hear like the tub banging around. They just didn't like each other. Yeah. And they would not breed. Yeah. Compatibility is a real thing, Dave. And again, think about it. Anacondas, cobras. You know, we know compatibilities in reptiles. It's the same here. For years and years, you know, as breeders, we used to think, oh, that female's not going to go this year. Mm. I'll give her the year off. In actual fact, it's the compatibility between the male and the female that's not interested. Right. And, you know, if you buy an exantic clown and you want to make more exantic clowns and you breed it to an, another exantic clown and it doesn't lock, but it'll lock with a, a pastel or with something completely different you know um it's compatibility it's it's a real thing dave i i would not have believed it until i witnessed it myself and then i wanted to put the male and, the, and that female with different spout with different you know males and females and they bred perfectly fine you know so you're 100 yeah. percent right in that sense let's yeah. um let's switch gears now for a second i want to talk about some of the different projects that maybe you're involved in i'm involved with what we think you know what we like about the projects you know, probably I would say the most, I guess, popular, you know, morph in ball pythons has to be clown at this point. Would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, clown, you know as well as I do, is is it's sort of again one of the first recessive genes that I believe that Tracy and Dave um, from from VPI actually thought would not prove out, and here That's we funny. are. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, you know. And here we are. We, you know, it's one of the most sought after stuff. But um, I wanted to speak about the hurricane stuff as well with you, Dave. So, oh, we're well, that, well, definitely going to talk about that. But you know, I think clown is is important because as a base, I mean, everyone seems to want to mix everything into clown, right? I mean, it's 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 just that's what people do now. I mean, I think Justin Kabilko probably was the one who really popularized doing that, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Justin um, has certainly sort of. Um, what's the word sort of um you know marketed certain genes uh and back into certain projects and and uplifted certain stuff um so yeah clown is is a very sought after one you know i'm making fingers crossed we're gonna uh, have some ultra male clowns this season again yeah, my, we're on point for fingers across too <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're on point for some more uh clown pies and some uh some interesting clown combos so let me ask you let me ask you about the clown pie pie because I, I know you're brutally honest like i am i i, I obviously am involved in that project too to a certain degree mm -hmm. clown and pie are the two most popular so it, it only makes sense to put them together right yeah um what do you think of the, of the clown pie um 
I, I like it, but what I want to do with it, Dave, I want to do like ultra male clown pieds. So mm. for me, the, the clown pied is a stepping stone in, in that project. It's not something that, and again, like you said, you know, they're, they're too sought after recessives. And what you'll find, which is crazy, yeah. some people who like pieds don't actually like clown pieds. And you're like, wow, I don't get it because I like both projects. Yeah. They're not that to me. They're not that spectacular and mixed together. I'm still waiting for someone to bring some more genes into it so that you can see more of the clown in the pie because I think the pie yeah. unravels that clown a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I produced um, a Gene X clown pie um, last season, a female, and I produced a pastel Gene X clown pie male, and I also during the clutches as well. I also hit some Gene X clowns now. Okay. I wanted to bring the Gene X out the pod and into the clown project. And again, trying to use the Gene X clown pod as a base. You know, now I can add Yellow Belly, we can add Enchi, right. we can add right. Orange Dream, we can add, sure. you know, multiple genes now to build on that clown pod. And like you said, make it, make it more of a clown snake with the pod features, you know? I think Enchi probably is, is something good to get in there. Although Enchi kind of unravels things too, but it, it gives you more... I, you know, sometimes when you get these pies that have too little, too little pattern and too much white, you kind of lose the effect too. I mean, yeah. everyone, everyone loves leopard, right? I mean, leopard pies but look like nothing. They have like one splotch of the pattern. Yeah, high, high okay. white pies. Yeah. Uh, for me, I love the berm pied. The berm pied for me is mm -hmm. is what I'd like to see our ball python pieds look like. I like agree. the hurricane pied. I'll tell you now, I believe, so I'm breeding – an ultra male pied to a yellow belly pastel leopard hurricane female. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make double heads, but we can make some high booster combos in the future, which are high booster right. pieds, high booster ultra males, and a mixture of yellow belly leopard thrown in in there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's we've got so much to do with the pied stuff um, that again we need to work it with the right genes. So I believe again the same with. Uh, the Sunset Pie project that I'm doing, um, I believe that I, I want to aim to make something like a berm pied is where it, I want to. It's yeah, the way the pattern is laid out in the berm pie. And I, I had I had berm, I had Burmese pythons pies, and I unfortunately, you know, I, I can't breed them anymore here in Florida. I have a dis I, I still can keep them for display and education. I got a very yeah. special permit, but yeah, I, I, I like the way that pie looks.